Sophia brought one for my surprise. I will go into Welcome your to Insight, everyone. I'm Namdi Odipo. You know, once I heard later, someone say that even a blind man can see, and that the deaf can hear the magnitude of conflict and tension in the political arena, especially before, during, and after changed a little bit. You know, the clock that was changing for you. Well, I guess the end of the day, I think you changed the clock instead. You want to share that story with us? We will also attempt to see how it was okay. just the 2007, and I was going to Kano for to have a meeting with one of my board members. In and in Zaria, I was in a car I also have a guest with them views on, on the national issues of profound I sustained the spinal cord injury. On national integration Amadi Bello Teaching Hospital well. was about five Elizabeth minutes away from the scene of the accident. But I couldn't be taken there because Elizabeth? doctors were on strike. On the media what? review this week, yes. we will be taking a look at So I was rescued and ended up in a maternity home. John and all they could do was just stop the bleeding, and of course, to eventually the next terror. day I was um, is, brought by ambulance to the National we, Hospital. Of course, journalists will carry out this responsibility. We have challenges. Five days they couldn't really do much for me. taking a look at the role of security agencies mm. in fighting terrorism. Uh, very well then, let's get started. Internal de democracy within political parties, party politics, vested interests, and um, also talk about corresponding tension in the polity arising from conflicts within political parties. My guest is Dr. Victor Oye, national chairman of the All Progressive Grand Alliance, Abga. Welcome to the program. I, I understand you're currently serving your second term as chairman of the party. Yeah, this is my sixth year, two months as national chairman. Oh, what wonderful. Um, how are you today, sir? I'm very fine. How are you too? Very well, thank you. Very well, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining yeah. us on Insight. Uh, I'd like to begin with um, an unfortunate situation, uh, but um, frequently put in our faces by political parties in Nigeria, whether they are the big ones, or incidentally, even the small ones do the same. And what I mean is the tossu by vested, very vested interest for the leadership of political parties from point to point, even when the party's constitution provides for tenor. Uh, I mean, this pervasive intra-party leadership tussle, is it a function of the paucity of um, genuine democratic, um, Democrats rather, in, within political parties? Uh, because you, you politicians or party people are the same ones who set the rules, and then the party members are also the same ones who dismiss the rules as set by their parties. And this often causes what we say as an, and describe as the lack of internal democracy in, within political parties in Nigeria. Uh, the truth of the matter is that uh, what is behind the whole crisis is greed on the part of some politicians, you know, and uh, impatience as well, greed for power. Uh, the constitutions constitution of the parties have been designed with internal mechanisms to ensure compliance by members with the rules of the game. But some people, you know, some people are naturally defiant, they understand, in nature. They don't operate where there is peace and tranquility. They love crisis, you know. When there is crisis, uh, you know, they make money from crisis and that's what is happening in almost all the political parties in Nigeria. why not wait for your turn you know this business is turn by turn when somebody is in office you cooperate with him at the completion of the study you can offer yourself for service it is the people that will choose you or reject you it is not to force yourself on the people that's why it's a democracy government of the people by the people and for the people uh, it's not for Mr. Chairman, I'd like for you to touch on the issues as it generally affects um, political parties in Nigeria. But, I mean, yeah. don't you find it paradoxical, or in fact an irony of sorts, that, that a union formed in the first instance by like-minded people, supposedly with shared ideology uh, as the baseline, can, can also be defined by individuals with divergent opinions, values, interests, and often fraught with conflict arising from mutually exclusive views, thoughts and interests. And, you know, when political parties cannot even manage themselves by building consensus, isn't that debilitating for our democracy? 
the issue you have raised is not about, uh, I've told you, not about the constitutions of the political party. It is about the persons that are found within the political parties. You know, political parties is a con collectivity of peoples of diverse interests, diverse religions, diverse ethnic backgrounds. They all come together. It's like a potpourri, you know? And when they come, they exhibit different characters. Mr. Chairman, what brings desires, them together different in the consistence? He said? What brings them together? They are from different backgrounds, different ethnic groups, different religions. Yes, what, brought them, them? what brought them together is interests. <laughs> That's what not ideology. Politics. Interests. Not That's ideology. All. Which ideology? Some political parties lack ideology. You said I shouldn't talk about my party. No, so, please don't. But I know that most political parties lack ideologies. Our own party, we have an ideology. And that ideology is people-centered. And that is why in the only state we have in Nigeria is doing very, very well. It's one of the best in Nigeria because we work in accordance with the manifesto of the party, which is built around the threats and welfare of the people. So if other political parties could do that, definitely there will be less tension in the political system. Do you understand? Because when you pay attention to individuals and leave the people for which the political parties were found, there are bound to be crises in the political parties. And when you talk about ideology, what is ideology? Ideology, to me, is something that will be a, 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 you know, a compass, something like a compass guiding the political parties in the implementation of its a, a programs for the people. So most political parties in Nigeria lack ideology. They just come together, band together for selfish interest. And that is why most political parties in Nigeria don't last up to 30 years. After 10, 15 years, 5, 3 years, they all die off. We started MPP in 1979. Where is MPP today? From MPP, we moved to, to uh, SDP. Where is SDP today? SDP is gone. Now we're in PDP era. Who knows how long PDP will last? We'll not have APC. How long will APC last? So there has been a multiplicity of political parties in Nigeria. And that is why before I next trimmed the number of political parties to 18, they used to be they, we used to have 91 political parties. It was a, a crowd. How can you manage a crowd? So the smaller the number, the better. And that is why in Nigeria's political life, the Electoral Act and the Constitution of Nigeria are the two culprits in generating this crisis. Because if the Electoral Act had design, was designed in such a way that nobody will have monopoly of the courts and all that, there will be definitely be peace in the political party. But where people go to do foreign shopping, you hold a primary in Aka, you go to Birinin Kebi, 946 kilometers for a judgment. How can you have stability in our political life? So in the Electoral Act, there should be, you know, mechanisms to control what happens in the political parties so that people will know their limits in whatever they do. But are, are, those, are those mechanisms not inherent in the party's constitution? Because the party constitution provides for mechanism to build consensus and to reach agreement. Must you allow the court, yes. the, the judiciary, to settle tosses, especially like leadership tosses for political parties, originally supposed to be people of like minds? Okay, let me tell you, for instance, in my party. Mr. Chairman, you keep going to your party, me. and I do not want us to talk about just one party okay, now, because this is an issue that cuts across. But your it's party, for instance, there is a faction of your party okay, no led by... Mr. Chairman, sorry, if you would just allow me to land, Mr. Chairman. Sorry, just one okay, minute. Let me just, let me just ask you this, because I really do not want to go into the issue of, um, uh, of parties or which specific party is having a leadership crisis. I wanted us to just talk generally on, on all political parties in Nigeria, because this is a general problem. Abga, for instance, has a leadership tussle. I don't know, I'm not sure if it has ended, but I do know there is a faction by the Jude OKK-led faction. And I know I hear and we read in the papers and we see press releases from them and we know. But we know that you are the current chairman of the party. 
You know, so it this is, is the problem that comes That's across, Mr. You. Chairman. So that was why I, I wanted us to look at it generally and talk about these issues as they affect political parties in Nigeria and not just Abga, not just APC, not just uh, the PDP. But please go ahead, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Yes, what I'm trying to say, I agree with you. Uh, you know, I'm versed in Nigeria's political life, so I can tell you that why I refer to the Electoral Act, you know, the Constitution of Nigeria is a grand norm. You know that. Exactly. After the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, you have the Electoral Act. After the Electoral Act, then you now have the Constitutions of the Parties. After the Constitutions of the Parties, you you now have the uh, elect electoral guidelines. I'm talking about sequence in order of uh, superiority. Okay. So if the electoral act, because there was a time INEC was in total control of political party management and uh, a scru 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 you know, screening of candidates and everything, they had total control. But at a point, they said that INEC started abusing their power. So they shifted the powers to the courts. <laughs> and that's where we are now. So the problem is now. I heard that they have, re they have returned the thing to the. They have returned the thing to the to the court. I mean, to the, to, to they have reduced the powers of the state high courts in handling political party matters and all that. So you find out that the truth of the matter is that our political system has been designed in such a way that there are no serious checks and balances. If people know that if they committed any infraction, they face the music, do you understand? Yeah. If such a, a, a situation occurs, it will be difficult for people to do certain things they have continued to do in our present political life. Where somebody can get up from his sleep and go to television and announce he's the new national chairman of a political party. <laughs> for me, it's crazy. It is because we don't have laws, effective laws, in a very serious climb, such a situation would not occur. By now, such people would have been dealt with in accordance with the law. So what I'm saying in essence is that our laws should be strengthened to take care of these infractions and contractions. Very, very important. Mm. And without that, we will never have peace in Nigeria's political life. Uh, very quickly, I'd like for us to get along here very, very real quick. We will fast losing time. There's another development that I find um, rather disturbing on party leadership. And that is the constant struggle between elected officials in public offices and party bigwigs over control of the headship of um, political parties. Why is it? that political parties do not separate party leadership from governmental leadership. And in a lot of cases, the two are under the, the leadership of one elected government official in the name of party leader. The result is, that in most cases, is, is either the elected official wins or the party bigwigs win. And the danger is that um, this leads to incessant um, defection by those who lost out of the struggle. They all, boil, they all boil down to the, to the laws. That's what I'm telling you now. You know, there's a provision in the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria about defections. You know that? Yes. But people defect anyhow and no consequences. You know, there is a action and reaction are equal and opposite. And when you breach that law, there will be anarchy. Then the law must take its course, full course. I understand that, Mr. Chairman, but is it possible to separate party leadership away from um, the leadership by an elected official? For, for instance, now, the, the governor of a state on the platform of, uh, let me say, party ABC, in, um, let me say, um, in Anioma State, for instance, if party ABC, if the governor is from and wins an election on the platform of party ABC in Anioma State, it, 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 it becomes the head of party ABC in Anioma State. That's exactly what I mean. Is it possible, isn't it possible to separate these two? I understood your question very clearly. It all boils down to the law. It's the constitution we are practicing, isn't it? Mm, the yeah. constitution places all powers and responsibilities on the chief executive of the state. And don't forget that he who call, who pays the paper calls the tune. It's as simple as that now. Yes, now. So in the political party, okay, do, does government fund the political parties? Where do the political parties get their funding from? 
that was, there was a time the government was giving 10 million naira to political parties. Now they don't give a dime. How do you expect the party to, to perform? So, so anybody that comes with any largess, they fall for that person. And that's what is causing the old furore in the political party. Okay. Do you understand it, what I'm saying? I, I do. I do. Yes. I, I'm going to need your help again. I'm going to need your help in clarifying another issue. Uh, this time, the issue of um, vested interest. But, but, um, yes. but uh, against that of the collective, of course, I can agree to a large extent that political interest is the main component of political motivations. But if democracy is to be fully functional in Nigeria, shouldn't political parties rise above the interest of one person? Maybe the chief executive, for instance. Shouldn't the political parties be strong enough, you know, in today's Nigeria to make elected leaders answerable to the party and ensure that the party remains supreme and that its ideologies, and I'll repeat, its ideologies and manifestos are carried out to the letter by that elected representative at all levels of government, not just the states now. I'm talking federal, state, local government. It is very, very possible. I don't want to talk about my party, but that's what we're doing. It's very possible. If you want political parties to be independent, you're talking about independence of political parties. They must be autonomous in terms of financing, in terms of administration. If they don't have that autonomy, they cannot operate. You're talking about autonomy for local government. Once you bring autonomy into the local government area, the local government councils, they will operate more independently and deliver the dividends of democracy to their people. But they all boil down to the constitution. Our present constitution is not working. Mm -hmm. We need to redesign the constitution to take care of these mm -hmm. gaps, okay? okay? And now, to build very strong political parties, we need to build institutions within the political party. Mm -hmm. If there are no institutions within the political party, they cannot you know, face the challenges of development. So for us, for me, I believe that the political parties in Nigeria have the capacity to grow, but they are choked, they are choked up okay. by control, by the executive that pays the bills. <laughs> but political parties can survive on their, on their own if they show responsibility, transparency, creativity, in the administration of political parties. Most people that seek political powers in Nigeria don't have the interest of the people at heart. Mm. All they are interested in is how to feather their nests. They don't have the interest of the people at heart. And it is because the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria has created gaps which they are exploiting for their egocentric interests. So for you to build a sustainable political culture in Nigeria, we need to redesign the constitution redesign the electoral act, put checks and balances here and there, and then the whoever contravenes goes contrary to the law will be dealt with in accordance with the law. That is the only way we can engender sustainable democracy, tranquility, and progress in our nation. I get, I get you. you. I, I get you, Mr. Chairman, but um, like, like I said, we're fast losing time. I'd like to hurry you along. I'd like for us to talk about something I consider quite um, germane, and um, yeah. it's on the concept and manifestation of godfatherism in Nigerian politics, uh, party politics. Uh, I do not just mean in terms of mentorship now, but you know the constant deterioration of relationships between the supposed godfathers and their godsons, or uh, maybe in some very few cases, goddaughters, as the case may be. Incidentally, since I mean, since the days of the Nigerian um, uh, National Democratic Party of 1922, we, we, we had the likes of Albert Macaulay mentoring young and aspiring politicians. Uh, we've also seen and had the likes of um, the strong man of your state, of your politics, Palamidi uh, Adedibu. I would allow you to draw and the viewer to draw the distinction between these two leaders that I've mentioned. But my question is, to what extent then can godfatherism be permissible in a democracy with strong checks to, to in place to ensure that the success or collapse of the relationship between the persons involved um, does not lead to um, unpalatable situations for the people of a state, for instance? Uh, you see, our, our politics has been monetized. It's not a pecuniary business. Do you understand? 
people no longer come to serve altruistically with the love of the people at heart. That is the major problem. Mm. And so they go sourcing sponsors. And when you get a sponsor, the sponsor will give you his condition, just like somebody going to the bank to seek a loan. Mm. They'll give you the conditions you have to meet to get the loan. So the same thing, somebody going for an election, he doesn't have the funding. Our politics are about money. You pay the delegate, you pay for this, you pay for that. So when they come into office, they try to recoup their investment. That's what is happening. So we have to make our politics less attractive, make a political office less attractive, mm. keep political offices for only those who really, really want to serve. Mm. Okay? Mm. They remove all the packs of office, you know? Every legislator must have a guy, a Prado, a land crew. These things help to boost, you know, promote corruption in our social system. So for me, Godfatherism is growing in Nigeria's, present Nigeria's political life because we have given teeth to it. We have given life to it. So if you don't want Godfatherism, make politics less attractive. Only those who are genuinely interested to serve can come forward and serve mm. with little or nothing as take home. Then you will see genuine people coming. So not that we are politics is products have been earnings will be watching out for the outcome of the first political political system we need to make our politics less attractive uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I would like to thank you so much for your insights on these matters and hope that um, our democracy deepens with political parties providing leadership and guidance. Dr. Victor Oye, National Chairman of the All Progressive Grand Alliance, APGA, thank you so much for coming on Insight. Thank you. God bless you. I God bless all Nigerians. Thank you. Thanks for staying with us. I'd like to redirect the conversation to other issues within the national polity. In the past week, we discussed how best to stir public consciousness towards national integration and unity. And so uh, I'd like to pursue that um, line of conversation with my guest here in the studio. Dr. Emma Isang is a Christian cleric and chairman of Cross River State Anti-Tax Agency. He's also the executive director of Center for Peace, Democracy and Development. Uh, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. Uh, nice to have you here. I, I know you're also a bishop, so from time to time I would be alternating between bishop and My pleasure. Doctor. Okay, let's get right into it. And I, I must say I'm intrigued by something I came across quite recently. Uh, uh, let me ask the director to put it up so I, I will just read it if we have it there already. Can we just put up, put it up? Okay, great. There, there it is. Uh, so I'll quote. Uh, there is nothing wrong with ethnic affiliations, but there is actually something wrong with nepotism. There is also nothing wrong with religious beliefs, but there is absolutely something wrong with religious fanaticism, extremism, which leads to terrorism. The same knife an assassin uses to take a life could be the same knife a surgeon uses to save a life. End of quote. I'm sure you recognize these words. These are actually yeah, words. Yeah, my words. Yes. To God's glory. <laughs> I, I would like for you to discuss this analogy within two contests. But um, I, I'd like, I, I would like, and I, I will try and lead the conversation in both directions. But firstly, use this analogy to speak within the purview of religion, fanaticism, and the dangers to national integration. Yeah, many people have asked questions over time uh, if religion and ethnicity are the major causes of our security challenges and, of course, political uh, uh, challenges. And the answer is that neither religion nor tribal affiliations are responsible. Uh, this may be used, only used by anybody for his nefarious and dubious intentions. That means nothing itself is wrong in being, in having a religious belief. Nothing itself is wrong in uh, having a, a tribal affiliation. But something, of course, is very wrong when those become instruments. And I, I, I quoted the knife, that the same knife an assassin uses to take a life. 
uh, it could be the same knife that a surgeon in the theater uses to save a life. So it is not the knife that is the problem here. Problem is the user of the knife, the application of the knife. So many Nigerians need to know. Uh, you know, feel free, have your belief, feel free, practice your religion. I've heard people within even the social media spaces, oh, these imams, these pastors, these religious people. And I had to be flown said, to Ghana. It could only be used as an open. I was in Ghana. With Nothing is wrong uh, with having your belief. But if I then uh, throw my belief, uh, ex you know, practice nepotism, mm -hmm. that means I exclude you who is not from my tribe or I persecute you who is not of the same faith with me. I think that's where I begin to have the problem. So I practice my right, mm -hmm. enjoy my privileges so far it does not infringe into some other person's space. That is what we need to practice in Nigeria. We just need to respect someone else's space and that we will find absolute peace. Mm -hmm. Our problem is not really those really? things. Yeah, so the knife has no problem. The knife would never use itself. The knife would never jump up and kill anybody. Uh, let, me, let me throw up an interesting but somewhat controversial perspective to, I mean, this whole issue of religion or religious affiliation in Nigeria. Uh, most analysts uh, of the trend here yeah, deduce, and rightly so, that the most important political fault line, the one between the North and the South, is clearly reinforced by their different religious orientations. As a matter of fact, a lot of people strongly believe that religious affiliation in Nigeria have become increasingly important, grown violent, and personally, I think, they demonstrate our proximity to past foreign pressures, which continue to affect many aspects of our history and culture. Uh, forgive me, Bishop, but I must say, I often wonder what could have been if modernization had blended with our traditional religious beliefs, which were pervasive, uh, proud <laughs> of pre-colonial rule. <laughs> yes, Bishop, it, it, it's almost laughable, you're, you're chuckling, but it is quite easy to notice that under increased economic and social pressure, the dominant religions today have this tendency or have the tendency to divide into even give more fragmented and divisive subsects. I'm here to help you. Yes, with political <laughs> intentions increasingly I'm here to help becoming you. the order of the day. But you know what, uh, Bishop? Yeah. Maybe the traditionalist may have the answers that we seek as a country. <laughs> Who knows? But I will give you the answer. I want, to, I want you to look at the scenario I'm going to paint right now. We have Christians and Muslims and traditionalists in the National Assembly. Yes, of course. Are they fighting based on religious... A traditionalists are actually not proud to be mentioned. Yeah, but, traditionalists. But, but Unfortunately. We, we assume they are there. And, they, and there is no fight towards their, religion, their belief line. They fight over their philosophical and their political line. So you, and I'll give you another scenario. When Nigeria is playing with Brazil, mm. and we have 11 players on the pitch, and they're playing against Brazil or Argentina or England. Have you ever heard that a Muslim passes the ball to a Christian? No, not yeah, at all. So, so you see the synergy there surpasses religious lines. So you can see that the Christians and the, and the uh, atheists or the Muslims and any other belief don't themselves have problem. They don't themselves. Oh, I'll give you a worse scenario now when the police arrest arm robbers that attacked a bank in Kwara State, do you notice some of them were Muslims and some were Christians? So the criminals are able to cooperate beyond religious the religious line. lines to go and rob a bank. So back to your uh, observation. So religion and ethnicity themselves are not uh, the challenges here, just like the knife of the, uh, of the surgeon or the assassin. So it is a weapon, rather, by political uh, players. Uh, okay, I'll give you an example. The AF EFCC arrests somebody mm. uh, for stealing so so amount of money. So he raises alarm and wide sentiments. Look, they are persecuting me because I'm a Christian. Mm. They, you see, they want to destroy Christianity in this country. You see, they have arrested me. And you see what they have done to me? Because I'm a Christian. And of course, without proper rule of the media enlightening the people, and without proper uh, explanation uh, by the religious leaders, anybody can believe. Of course, you know about journalism, you're a journalist. When once there is a gap, somebody else fills the gap for you. 
Mm. Uh, somebody else fills the gap. So I believe it's, it's the it's a duty of religious leaders of whatever inclination and the duty of the media to keep the enlightenment. I'm sure what we are doing here is helping someone yes. that if these guys are not fighting when they're going to rob a bank and they're not fighting when the National Assembly sharing themselves together and doing some good things they are doing, if they are not fighting, the president of Nigeria is a Muslim, vice president is a Christian. How come I so wrong is not burning because of that? Why are they sitting down? Over a cup of coffee. So it is not it's, religion. That is what I'm trying to. Do. So what then? Why is it being used as a weapon? I, I will give you some some of my observations and possibly suggestions. I have told somebody before, in filling a national data, we should exclude something like religion. Okay. Exclude something like nationality. Uh, state of, you know, state, yeah, ethnicity, state yeah. of origin. Exclude all those things that will make someone who fill that form to feel Nigerian first. Yes, let him be Nigerian first. Because he gets already prejudiced uh, and he gets already biased. He gets already, even as you're filling that form, if you know the director general is a Muslim and he said, you want a contract here, so are you a Christian? And you're like, yes, Christian, you are shivering. Some Christians want to become Muslims so that they can get favor, and some Muslims also want to Christian. pretend to be Christians for five minutes so they can also get favor. So expunge all these clauses from our civil service system, from our official system, and let somebody be seen, first of all, as a Nigerian. When you go to America, some senators of New York were never born in New York. They didn't even grow up in New York. You know, you know whom I'm talking about. Uh, and they didn't even were born there. And even some presidents of America were not even Americans originally. They, they are, they're from Kenya. They are, they, they are the children of a migrant. Yeah, so you can born see. In America, born in America. Born in America. never yeah, be the American. I know you can't be American. But I'm America, aware of yes. that. <laughs> but, but, but they are not originally f uh, you know, they, from they, America. Their parents are yeah, not Americans. They, they, they trade their assets. And they are from, being from respected because of. I, I, I also suggest we expunge federal character system. A sponge quota system. Mm. These are these are very myopic, small-minded policies we made in the past, maybe to have corrected some imbalance, but has been outlived with modernity that you are talking about. With time, we, we should we should wake up and live up to the community of nation. The world is a global village. I, I, and, I, I, and let credibility, let somebody's qualification speak for him. I, I hear you, Doc. I mean, I hear you loud and clear. And I mean, you've just um, referenced the need for us as a people now and as a country to, to focus more on excellence rather than uh, where this person is from or where that person is from. And times have indeed changed, you know, like you've said. But I recall saying that we will discuss this, your analogy, on national integration within two countries. We have done, we seem to have done justice to the first aspect, and so let's move on to scenario two. Using the same analogy, is it possible to draw a distinction between self-actualization and nationalism, and exactly how they both vary from patriotism? Well, and you know, that's a challenge we have in Nigeria. We're not able to draw a line between personal interest and national interest. Uh, Maybe you should try and play the Nigerian anthem <laughs> in public and take a look at our attitude towards simple things like Nigerian anthem. Maybe also drive through offices and see our respect to our national flag and our national uh, colors and national anthem. You will be sad. Many Nigerian leaders, uh, I'm, I'm, I may be slow to say our political leaders, uh, they pursue uh, self-interest first, above national interest. I think it's high time we came to realization that if there's no country called Nigeria first, we will not even be able to realize our individual goals mm. and aspirations. So, uh, I mean, if the house is burning, you can't even sleep inside. Of and course. you cannot throw a stone if you stay in a glass house. So. That's what we yet to know. Somebody, I, I read something before I came here, that some of these very countries that were bastardized by genocide and by terrible famine and, 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 and catastrophes, don't even speak against their countries. Rwandans, Ethiopians, and many of these nations, they don't speak against their countries. But Nigerians are still happy. You go to a restaurant this morning, it's full. 
You go to the street, they're happy people playing music, people bury their mothers with big, large amount of money, and people are happy, churches are full, mosques are full. Well, couples and pockets of uh, challenges here and there, which is very worrisome uh, to a, a, a peaceful country like this. But, but I think our level of condemning our nation and speaking evil against the only country we have, I've been around about 50 nations in five continents, and I think I know what I'm talking about. I've studied the perspective of other nationals as per their country in the midst of the hottest moment. They have never for a moment spoken evil against their country. I think Americans can even die for the American flag. Yeah. I, I, they, they can give their life for that. Well, but Doc, I get all you're saying, but isn't patriotism latent at best on leadership? Well, we hear about um, leadership. Yeah, I know it's reciprocal. I am aware that uh, <laughs> that is reciprocal, that the leadership, you know, we've not come to that. You've not asked me a question on that. I, I'm talking about now a situation we should look at the coin, the both sides of the coin. coin of course. Because, because Nigerians yeah. always look at, for instance, what is government? For instance, I'm not defending anybody here. I'm not somebody's commissioner for, for information. But what is government? The, the last answers, youths went around destroying basic infrastructures that would speak for their future. They, they destroy their lives, their, what they would depend on. I mean, you destroy facilities that would in turn cater for your children and children's children as and venting an anger mm. against bad government or against police br brutality. Mm. I mean, I've, I found that lack of knowledge. Exactly. Uh, yes, lack of knowledge. We, we, we have to take responsibility and we have to uh, we have to redefine governance mm. because our definition of governance and politicians should help us do this has been that man in government house speaking to us like mm. a, a, an herald and we prostrate before him cap in hand get some palliative and go eat please sir, get something for me please when you get there remember our village or no so i think we should redefine governor i told somebody i do not even believe the country should be pumping money to people's hands that's not even the best economy the best economy is make the environment conducive for all of us mm. uh, give us ease of doing business and make the son of the poor man be able to go to school together with the son of the rich man let facilities be accessible i'll give you a very big example a nigerian top man a big guy in nigeria cannot move on the street alone without two, three securities. But this same man goes to London, I've met them on the street and in, in the mall, and walks alone with a knicker. He wears a knicker, he wears a short sleeve, and walks alone with a shopping bag. So what's going on there? So you see, the, we should not emphasize the prosperity of individuals. Mm. We should emphasize the prosperity of our nation, mm. ability to assess education, health care, and to make security the common and the commonest goal of government to protect lives and properties. Um, Doc, I, again, I hear you. I mean, these are really profound. I mean, uh, quite insightful. But um, I, I'd like for us um, to just pu uh, push ahead now because we're fast losing time so we can cover as much ground as possible. Uh, the 1999 Constitution makes it very clear that Nigeria's unity is sacrosanct. But to truly achieve this, our leaders and, of course, the citizenry realize that Nigeria uh, as a nation must continue to promote justice, equity and fairness amongst the diverse groups, uh, and I mean ethnic nationalities in the country. However, some might say that the forces that balance is Nigeria's unity seem fragile and has been like that for, for decades now. I mean, it's not just that it happened over the last four or five years or six years. It's been like that for decades now. How possible is it to reignite the spirit of togetherness that inspired the struggle for Nigeria's independence and rekindle that zeal in today's Nigeria? Break down the walls of partition. Esponge those nomenclatures from our constitution. Raise a new consciousness of a new Nigeria. Let people see themselves more as Nigerians than their villages. <laughs> because what is happening now, we are living in little, little villages and come to meet in Abuja or Lagos or somewhere as Nigerians. Th there must be a realization that uh, we are people of common interests. Uh, if we talk of diversities of ethnicity, 
I think there are other countries that have similar situation like Nigeria. But look at, I keep quoting the United States of America because it's the mother of all democracies. Chinese American, Japanese American, Ethiopian American, uh, Nigerian American, <laughs> Black American, until you even have Russian Americans. I don't know which country has not stepped into America. So if we talk of plurality and diversity and multiplicity of ethnicity, we could use United States of America as example. Yet, governmental policies, system of justice and fair play is able to synergize and harmonize and synchronize all these multiple uh, colors and languages together. It's about policies. It's about understanding that if something, I talk about accessibility mm. of government infrastructure, accessibility of funds, I mean, the, the infrastructure should be open to everybody. When decisions, when government decisions, uh, you know, open up for the son of the poor man to mix up with the son of the rich man, like I said, take away this quota system thing, take away this feral character thing. They are, they are ancient languages, they are cake. They are not practiced again. I mean, you get qualified, you get the job. You get to the street, you qualified, you get the payment. You get to the bank, you don't have to depend on who knows who. Because right now, we are depending on who knows who. The Nigeria, we don't want to live together because we are too many in, in different languages. We have different food and culture. Are we not together in NMPC? <laughs> Those of us working in NMPC, are you not of different languages? Those of you in Central Bank, why are you having your board meeting and you share together? Why are you all happy together there, but you're not happy together in the big Nigeria? So something is wrong somewhere. So where people have eaten and they're happy, like in the National Assembly, they, are, they don't talk about uh, how to split. So get back, put food on the table, make security and infrastructure accessible to every Nigerian. I know everybody wants to stay together. Uh, who nobody wants to split. Uh, Doc, you've mentioned security a number of times yes. since our conversation. I, I, I must confess that I did a bit of check on you. In fact, I read and then watched some of your sermons to your congregation at the Christian Central Chapel International. And I must again confess that I found a lot of them quite um, profound. I I'd like to pick up on one, though, and um, th that someone was um, delivered by you early January this year. Uh, I'm not so sure, maybe it was fourth or fifth, but maybe some, I'm not so sure. But in that someone, you seemed very concerned about Nigeria's worsening security challenges. I, I read what you said about the entire situation and God's message to you for 2021, but I didn't see or hear the prospects for a solution to Nigeria's security challenges in that someone. Uh, do you perhaps want to share that here with us on insight? Yeah, thank you for taking us back to this discussion on security. Let me, let me, let me remind you that everything rises and falls on security. Do you know the amount of money you spend per day running your business or ministry, if you like, whatever, it would depend on uh, how much security is, uh, is involved. Investment into the country and out of the country depends on security situation. Even what we are doing today, uh, having this broadcast, it depends on security situation. When once there is absolute security, there is ease of being doing business, there is everything revolves around this thing called security. You're not safe and you are afraid of going out everything collapses. Okay, look at just the COVID-19 in experience that we had a short lockdown, yeah. the first lockdown. Do you remember? I do. People, people died. That is not civil war yet. That is not uh, any kind of problem yet. That's just lockdown, COVID-19. And food prices went up, transportation broke down, communication broke down, churches and mosques closed down. So. Without security, we can't go anywhere. As for solution, when I, when I spoke in January, I'm sure you are watching, you were watching the clip for the prophetic, uh, usually every that, year that, that I release the prophecies for the year. No, you, there is much, there's not much I can break down there because you are talking about hundred and something prophecies and there's no time people can wait too long in church. So you can only uh, bring in piecemeal a so But what would your recommendations be very quickly because we're totally out of time? Roundtable discussion. Okay. There should be roundtable discussion of all ethnic nationalities. Uh, possibly we should look for a review or adoption of the past report of the uh, 
national comfort. But we could pick something from there. I think everybody said something that time, and government really spent money okay. uh, on that comfort. We should bring it back, review it, adopt it. I think we'll go forward with that. Uh, finally, then, Dr. Esson, before I let you go, I mean, uh, time and time again, in the past, we used to hear that the problem with our... And I just want to talk a bit of politics before I let you go. Uh, in, in the past, we used to hear that um, the problem with our political process was the lack of um, strong laws, you know, the, the, the strong laws and then, of course, um, you know, absence of these laws. But, but now we know that even in the presence of strong laws, the implementation is also an issue. And of course, there's also the issue of the attitude of the people towards laws and implementation of laws. I mean, w w for you, what do you think the challenge is? Is it constitutional amendment? Is it electoral amendment? Is it um, an old new constitution? Or uh, we should we be talking about the, uh, the presence of strong laws, implementation of the strong laws, and the people's attitude as well, very quickly? I think both. We talk about both. Yes, there are some aspects of the Constitution that will need to be reviewed, amended as soon as possible. But like you talk about attitude, our people have not yet come to a point of accepting that we should expunge impunity and immunity from our constitutions. We should take it off. I'm talking about going to the airport. Everybody should be subject to the same rules. I'm talking about having access to any national information or, or, or asset. Everybody should be subject. Let's expunge immunity, impunity from our legal system. Then we have justice and equity. I want to thank you so much, um, Bishop, for coming on Insight. It's been a delight um, speaking pleasure. with you. I've actually, you know, I mean, it's, it's like I anticipated, it's even more. And I would like to um, see you back on this program on Insight sometime real soon so we can take up on issue. I, I know you have some background in, um, in taxation. I would also have loved to bring that up, the issue of multiple taxation and all of that, Dr. Um, M.I. Essang, um, uh, Clary. You're also a public speaker from the bits of research that I did on you, and I also know that you've traveled quite a bit um, to almost more than 50 countries in five continents. I would like to be like you when I grow up, sir. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Um, you're also chairman Cross River State Anti Tax, Anti -tax Agency. You've got plenty on your plate. I want to thank you so much for coming on Insight. It's been a delight My pleasure. speaking to you. Thank yeah, you. Thank you so much indeed. Up next is Elizabeth Omoruyi with the media review segment. In recent times, journalists have faced great challenges when covering repeated terror attacks. New dynamics of terrorism and the move to an increasingly digital and social media environment with its wide reach and unprecedented speed with which information spreads across online channels in particular, pose a serious challenge to reporting on the issue. How do we curb terrorism using the media as a veritable instrument? My guest, Ayo Kunli Fagbemi, a national security defense management scholar who also doubles as a conflict mitigation specialist, will deal on our focus. Mr. Fagbemi, thank you so much for coming on Insight. Thank you very much for having me. Now, the threat from terrorism is high and could worsen over time. Can we have your thoughts on this? I think the easiest way to go about it is to ask ourselves what exactly do we mean by terrorism? Terrorism is clearly defined within the ambits of our national security strategy, defined within the context of the national defense policy, and then within the ambits of our legal and policy frameworks, that is the Constitution, the Terrorism Act, and all other legal instruments. In a nutshell, what you're dealing with is act of series of criminal activities perpetrated against a people in a particular geographic expression okay. and in such a manner that creates fear and done in such a manner that if care is not taken, it becomes cyclical, it becomes repetitive. And once you miss the opportunity of defining and approaching and engaging it within the ambits of the law, there is a tendency of it becoming a major threat. Okay. Some of them crisscross international borders and they are titled 
trans-border crimes and criminality. If you do not attack these issues correctly at the early stages and do the needful of prosecuting and bringing some of the actors to book in such a manner that you would create a deterrence, then it has tendencies to escalate the way it has. All right. Um, uh, several recommendations from studies have shown that if concerted efforts are not intensified, extremists will continue to exploit fragile and violent prone states. As a conflict specialist, what strategies are world economies not employing? Um, I think the major challenge we are dealing with within the Nigerian state, and some of us have had the opportunity of making such uh, presentations to help correct the approach and methodological systems that we are deploying. It's so easy to use the phrase terrorism, banditry, without first and foremost taking a look at the manifestations. When you look at the manifestations of all these issues, you will see clearly that there are security breaches, and these security breaches are very clear. If you do not label correctly ab initio, and you do not perceive that there are short-term and long-term implications of all these criminal activities that we are labeling as terrorist activities, right. we will end up having multiple security breaches. It is a collection of a host of issues. Educational security has already been adversely affected by all these criminal activities because they were sacking schools. It started with Bununyaji, then you had the abduction in Chibok, you had the abduction in a host, Dapchi, and all that. And all this have now moved from the northeast into the northwest. When you consider all this, you will now see that there's another component that has been adversely affected. With the criminal encroachment on parcels of land that were being used by citizens for farming, yeah. you're now asking, how do we ensure that our responsiveness is adequate in managing the situation? The first place to start is to kindly plead with those who are in charge of our security apparatus to kindly start using the correct label for the issues that we are dealing with. These people that you are saying are now extremists become bold oh. because they are no longer being brought to book. And it is simply because when you look at what we call terrorism, it has various dimensions. There is a dimension of the organized crime and organized crime is usually a network. The network of organized crime even include some elements, either past or serving in the security and law enforcement system. All right, system. I'd like to come in there. Uh, in relating these attacks, have the media been responsive in making the people understand the dangers inherent if silence is adopted? And I'm happy you are familiar with the media, Terry. Occasionally, the information that the print and electronic media report, which is a reflection of the reality, are often countermanded. In this age of social media, alternate media that people have access to, the traditional conservative media people are put in jeopardy. And when you step a bit out of tune, it makes it difficult. It is not the problem of the media. It is the sincerity and level of willingness of public office or holders to truly accept, to engage professionally, and use the existing legal and policy frameworks. All right, Mr. Ayokunle Fagwemi, thank you so much for coming on Insights. Thank you for your contributions. Thank you very much for having me. And that is it on this episode of the program. Do join us same time next week for more on Insights. My name is Inam Diodigo. And I'm Elizabeth Omori. Be your brother's keeper. We'll see you next week.